But in terms of change in the lives of ordinary people, one of the things that's happened, it's happened in South Africa, for example, is a massive sense of disappointment when a liberation movement comes into power. What have you done to, to make their lives better? In practical ways, lots of roads. Now, you may think that that's not much because you've come from a country where you've taken roads for granted since your grandfather's time. But in our country, that means a lot because all weather roads make a great difference to one's lives. Last year, we started out by saying that uh, at the top of our priorities uh, was uh, job creation. And we discovered over this one year that if you start constructing all weather roads, and if you provide electrification, then people start creating jobs for themselves. And that is what has made one of the big differences. But uh, I think uh, what we think we've done best, or rather what I think we've done best, is to take forward the peace movement, the peace process. We're not there by any means, and uh, we can't say that we've got to the point when we, uh, we can say we're home and dry, but still, I think uh, there's been success there particularly because the people have become involved in it. You mentioned the peace process and you felt proud that it was an achievement in the last year, but right at the moment you have some of the most bitter fighting taking place on the borders of this country with ethnic groups. But Fergal, you work for peace simply, particularly because there's fighting. I mean, if there were no fighting, there would be no need for us to work for peace. If there were no fighting at all, if all this settles down, then that means the peace process is over. And I did say at the begin beginning that we're not there yet. You don't control the army. You don't control the security forces. And when fighting breaks out, they're free to go in and do what they've always done, and that's rape, pillage, and torture. Uh, they're not free to rape, pillage, and torture. Uh, that they're not free to do. They have, they're free to go in and fight. And of course, that's in the Constitution. You will have read it, that uh, military matters are to be left to the army. And uh, that's why we're trying to change the Constitution. We've been very open about it. Amending the con Constitution is one of our aims. Because according to the National Ceasefire Agreement, uh, one of the last steps would be to, con uh, to adopt a federal constitution. If you look at the history of this country, it's been going on since independence. Fergal, you were in South Africa, but you did manage to end apartheid there, didn't you? Not you, but the South Africans. Are we talking months or years? We hope that it's not going to be more than a few years. That's what we're aiming at. There have been advances in health care and critically more free elections. But all of this has been overshadowed by the terror in Rakhine State, where tens of thousands of Rohingya Muslims have fled what human rights groups call ethnic cleansing and about which Aung San Suu Kyi has been condemned for failing to speak out. Can I come to the issue which has caused most international uh, concern um, and which has led to a real turnabout in the way that you are perceived internationally? And you're aware of this. You've seen the newspaper headlines. You've seen the comments from uh, international figures condemning how you've handled the issue of the Rohingya Muslims. Well, what exactly is it that they are condemning? They want you to allow a UN fact-finding mission into Rakhine State? That, that is just now. That is just what they asked for um, last month. But uh, what is it that they have been condemning over the last um, year? Many, many people, including those who would be sympathetic to you, look at the situation and say, why hasn't she spoken out? Here's an icon of human rights. What, what do you mean why, by speaking out? Now, Fergal, mm. this question has been asked since 2013, when mm. the troubles, uh, the last round of troubles broke out in the Rakhine. And they would ask me questions and I would answer them and people would say I said nothing, simply because I didn't make the kind of statements which they thought I should make, which was to condemn one community or the other. Well, let me quote to you what your fellow Nobel laureates said of you. Despite repeated appeals to Do Aung San Suu Kyi, we are frustrated that she has not taken any initiative to ensure full and equal citizenship rights of the Rohingyas. Do Suu Kyi is the leader and is the one with the primary responsibility to lead and lead with courage, humanity and compassion. Basically they're saying you failed the test of humanity. Well, uh, that is uh, their perception, but have they considered the fact that one of the first things we started to do after we took over the administration was to go through the national verification process to give citizenship to all those who are entitled to it. 
and we started doing this and uh, engaging in other development activities to try to bring about stability and harmony because I think a lot of the problems in the Rakhine state uh, are due to the fact that uh, the resources are limited and both communities are anxious about how their lives are going to pan out. What happened was that in October there was these totally unexpected attacks on police outputs, uh, outposts for no reason that we could think of because we had started the citizenship verification process, we had started the process of trying to bring back people, people out of the IDP camps and resettle them but of course the whole thing went awry because these attacks took place and we have no idea why this attack took, took place but a lot of people uh, prefer to ignore the fact that these had happened at all. Why? I've been there myself on the ground on a number of occasions and, and interviewed people and I would say I'm someone who, who recognises ethnic hatred and ethnic cleansing when I see it after Rwanda, uh, after the Balkans. And maybe those attacks took place because there is a rising sense of frustration there and that has fed into the hands of militants. But uh, as far as we could make out, at that time things were calm because people were waiting to see how uh, we were going to go on with our development pr uh, plans and with the nationality verification plans. But I just wondered whether there it, those uh, attacks were calculated to put a stop to this process. Wouldn't the wisest thing to do to clear up all of this would be to allow an international fact-finding commission in, to allow international agencies in? Well, we invited Dr. Kofi Annan's commission to look into the situation in the Rakhine before anything had happened. It was not because the United Nations asked for this. It was not because any, any, body, any other body insisted that we should have a fact-finding mission. We invited Dr. Kofi Annan to form this commission to look into the problems in the Rakhine to help us to find long-term solutions. We would very much like him to come back to see how we are getting on with the implementation of his recommendations. Would you be happy, would you appeal to those tens of thousands who have fled the country into refugee camps in Bangladesh to come back and would you tell them that they'll be safe if they do? If they come back they'll be safe. It's up for them, to them to decide. Some have been coming back and we've been trying to find out why they fled and they said it was because of the fighting. Uh, they didn't want to stay in an area where there was fighting going on. Well, it you was will too welcome dangerous. them back. We welcome them. We, it, it's not a matter of we will welcome them back. They have been coming back and those who have come back have been welcomed. Do you ever worry that you will be remembered as the champion of human rights, the Nobel laureate who failed to stand up to ethnic cleansing in her own country? No, because I don't think there's ethnic cleansing going on. I think ethnic cleansing is too strong a, an expression to use for what's happening. It's there's what a, I think I saw of, there, I have to say. Uh, Fergal, I think there's a lot of hostility there. And uh, as I pointed out just now, it's Muslims killing Muslims as well, if they think that they're collaborating with the authorities. So it's not just a matter of ethnic clen cleansing, as you put it. It's a matter of people on different sides of a divide. And this divide, we, try, uh, we are trying to close up as best as possible and not to widen it further. Do you think that people in the West misjudged you or mischaracterized you or misunderstood you, um, expecting you to be this sort of amalgam of Mahatma Gandhi and, and Mother Teresa, for example? And, and actually, maybe you're closer in your determination and steeliness to someone like Margaret Thatcher. Well, no, I'm just a politician. I'm not quite like Margaret Thatcher, no. But on the other hand, I'm no Mother Teresa either. I've never said I was. Um, Mahatma Gandhi actually was a very astute politician. He did, it has to be said, put his own safety at risk and ultimately, tragically, to try and protect the minority Muslim population. Was that an example you would not be tempted to follow? I think I, it's not that... Uh, I don't think that putting one's uh, life at risk is a particular example that I'd like to follow, but I would like to think that we could live up to his high principles. One last question. What would stop you going now to Rakhine State 
and talking to all communities and appealing for peace on the ground but yourself. But because I want to give those who are working on the Rakhine a chance to show that they're capable of it, I think there's not enough confidence in what our people are capable of doing. The situation is volatile. At Yangon Airport in January, an assassin moves up to one of Aung San Suu Kyi's top advisers, the Muslim lawyer Ukoni, holding his grandson in his arms. He was shot dead a moment later. He'd been helping to draft changes to the constitution. Elements in military intelligence are among those suspected of organizing the attack. Aung San Suu Kyi was criticized for waiting a month before speaking out about his death, but subsequently called him a martyr for the nation. Do you worry that people who don't want you to change the constitution, who are embedded in the military, embedded in intelligence, are going to target you and the people around you? Well, it's not something I think about because we, we were asked the same set of questions over the last 30 years since we started working for the NLD, that aren't we worried about, um, with assassin uh, aren't we worried about assassination and all kinds of other dangers coming from the powers that be, those who are in a position to engage in these activities. But it's not something that you think about on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just uh, part of the job.